Webster's Dictionary describes love as a feeling of strong or constant affection for a person and having a deep romantic or sexual attachment to someone. American psychologist Robert Sternberg, who developed the triangular theory of love, lists three primary kinds as intimate, passionate, and committed, which branch off into seven different forms of love. Helen E. Fisher, who studied love and human behavior for over 30 years, researched the human biological reaction to love and talks about it in Time Magazine's article, Your Brain in Love, where she said this, We are coming to some understanding of the drive to love. This passion emanates from the motor of the mind, and it is fueled by at least one of nature's most powerful stimulants, dopamine. When passion is returned, the brain tacks on positive emotions, such as elation and hope, an evolutionary miracle designed to produce more humans. Finally, Professor Aaron Long Crowell examines love from an evolutionary perspective, breaking it down into two theories, equity and attachment, summed up in this quote. The evolutionary theory of love proposes that love functions to attract and retain a mate for the purpose of reproducing, and then caring for the resulting offspring. In other words, our ultimate goal is successful reproduction, and the feeling of romantic love that we experience is merely a tool to help us reach that goal. There are countless novels, poems, and songs telling us that love is an uncontrollable emotion that cannot be helped and leads us to do crazy things. With so many involved ideas, mankind's endeavor to understand love is ongoing. But 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 answers our questions best. It reads, Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. People often color love as crazy. Some commit violent acts towards each other and claim it's out of love for the other person. Even murder has been called a crime of passion. After looking at the world's standard of love in its limited capacity, I want people to know that there's a deeper, spiritual kind of love that's anything but irrational and out of control. That it's in fact within everyone's reach. That it holds us together and grounds us in ways we're not normally led to believe. First, it grounds our marriages which continue to fall apart in today's society where we nurture the idea that we have to love ourselves first and think of our needs, and that if we become too unhappy, we shouldn't try any harder. A lasting relationship isn't always easy, but it wasn't sanctified by God so that we could get half of everything or what we feel we deserve for putting up with that person. It's for two people joined together in God's love to represent the way He loves us to the rest of the world. Luke 6, 31-34 says, Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. This was Jesus preaching his well-known Sermon on the Mount to the people about what sets a spirit-filled love apart from the rest of the world. Can we not apply this to who we've married? And what would the differences be if we did? Start treating our spouse the way we want to be treated even when they don't do good to us, and they won't all the time. But wouldn't you want them to love you, even when they didn't always receive that back? The first scripture I read in 1 Corinthians, just imagine the way your relationship would change if he or she was patient, kind, not jealous, unprovoked, forgot the wrongs suffered, and endured. Of course we'd look crazy to the world. It's not in their nature. It's not in ours. 
But God's love is made perfect in us. In this article titled, Love as an Evolutionary Adaptation, this college student begins saying, By its very nature, love is an irrational and capricious emotion. But Paul wrote this to the Ephesians in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. We ought to be rooted and grounded in love even though it surpasses our knowledge. Some of the value of God's love can be recognized in Proverbs 31.10 that reads, An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. It goes on to say she has strength, dignity, wisdom, and teaches kindness, that her children bless her and her husband praises her. And Proverbs 20, 6-7 says, Many a man claims to have unfailing love, but a faithful man who can find. The righteous man leads a blameless life. Blessed are his children after him. Not only do we receive such blessings, but our children do too. So we benefit greatly by utilizing God's love in our marriage, and most importantly, it glorifies God. Secondly, it grounds us in our relationships. Again, this is Paul explaining the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5.13 For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfillment in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When you wake up in the morning, who's the first person you think of? Are you anxious for the chance to brighten someone else's day? To be encouraging at work? Help a neighbor in need? Would you maybe tidy up the house for your significant other? Or do you have to take care of your needs? There are days I wake up, go to the kitchen, and Fernando and I have this marker board hung up with a to-do list for the day. But sometimes he'll leave me little messages or drawings. And I'm usually moody when I've just gotten up. But I'll look at the board and Fernando will have left me a message or he may have bought some Hershey's chocolate bars and set them on the table with uh, something just sweet on the board just before he's gone to work. And it'd be a struggle to have a bad morning after that. Something small can change the tone of a person's day. It may even change your attitude. As we read on in the same chapter of Galatians, verses 19 through 21, our flesh demands different. Now the deeds of our flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. But perhaps we could replace these in ourselves, or change it in the hearts of others with the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Christians have been painted in a negative light with the notably bad examples out there, burned by churches full of hypocrites so that we are not where they turn anymore for help. We've slid back, silently afraid to offend anyone or be lumped in with that group of bad Christians. Well, God's message is not offensive. It's not something we need to apologize for. There's hope in it that people out there desperately need in their lives. All you have to do is share it. And if you do that in love, it's not going to fail. How would the world be different 
if everyone was filled with the Spirit and loved with a godly love. The Holy Spirit is our conscience and keeps us from setting foot on the wrong path. It gives us the Spirit of love, which is greater than each of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Love helps us make sane decisions. Romans 12, 14 through 19 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Ephesians 4, 2 through 3 with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If we love in our relationships the way we're supposed to love, we'll have peace, and God's peace passes all understanding. So, if love grounds us in our marriages and grounds us in our relationships, then we are going to be grounded in our friendship with God. After all, isn't that what we really seek? A closer walk with Him? In fulfilling His law, we not only bless those around us, but we glorify God, and in our obedience, we can have true joy. Jesus said in John 15, 9 through 13, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. The joy of the Lord is to be content whether we have a little or a lot. I would find myself frustrated in the months where Fernando and I had planned to travel or decorate the house, or I'd saved up a little bit of money for something that I wanted, and then there'd be car troubles, or we'd need cat food, gas, food for ourselves. Then, of course, it would get spent, and I would get upset, and direct my anger in just all the wrong places. As if I wasn't blessed enough just to have all the things that I thought we needed, and I forget when it happened, but it was just very recent that I thought, you know, God sees the full picture, and I don't. So the extra money that I saved, or the Fernando held back that I had destined for painting a room, buying DVDs, or whatever, God gave to us because he knew we'd need a little something extra that month. And that money was never mine but for God to use so that his promise to take care of me would be fulfilled. And when he revealed that to me, I had a peace in my heart. I may not always get the things that I want, but I'm blessed to get the things that I need, and that's the joy of the Lord. The closer we get to him, the more of that we can have in our lives. And it's not just financial security. Psalms 91, 14 through 16 says, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life I will satisfy him, and let him see my salvation. If we truly got up every day believing this in our hearts, what would we have to fear? How could you be sad? How could you speak anything negative? We ought to be lit up from the inside out, willing to do good in His name. Because we've got the God-given ability through Christ's love to conquer. Romans 8, 35-39 Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our friendship, our love for God, brings us joy and security and makes us conquerors in this world among so many other things. We love him because he first loved us and the way he loves us is how we're supposed to love others. That love is patient, kind, not jealous, not bragging, not arrogant, isn't unbecoming, doesn't seek its own, it isn't provoked, doesn't take into account wrongs suffered, won't rejoice in unrighteousness, but instead in truth. And really just let this soak in. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That may look crazy to the world, but the Bible says it will never fail.